Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Love Fruit podcast and we have a fantastic guest today, uh, a legend in the world of the raw vegan fruitarian movement lifestyle, um, Michael Arnstein and Michael is known as the fruitarian and and, uh, I believe we're going to hear a bit more about his story but I believe that athletic performance was one of the reasons that he came into into learning more about raw food and, and the fruit-based diet. And he's uh, been an ultramarathon runner and won many ultramarathon races. And he also started the biggest event in the world for people that are interested in a fruit-based raw vegan diet, which is the Woodstock Fruit Festival, which is going to be held for the 10th time this year. And hopefully we'll, learn, we'll hear more about that as well. So I want to introduce everyone to who not who, if you've not met before. This is Michael Arnstein. Thank you for joining us today, Michael. Hey, Ronnie. Thank you for putting on put me on the show. <laughs> Excellent. And and the first thing I want to uh, kind of do is go right back to the beginning for you. And why did you make this choice to uh, go towards a fruitarian diet? How did that happen? I've been an athlete most of my life, and my my first uh, push into fruitarianism uh, was mainly for per- athletic performance. I had already uh, become a vegetarian for ethical reasons uh, at the age of sixteen. All right. And uh, you know, I haven't had any um, I haven't eaten any red meat or or, or uh, anything like that since I'm uh, sixteen. I'm forty three now, so that's pretty much a lifelong commitment. I feel real good about that. And uh, the fruitarian diet was, it was all about athletic performance for me. And where did you hear about, like, how did you, uh, was it a, a person, a book, was it a video? What was like the first exposure you had to it? My, my wife was interested in raw food diets uh, in her own goals, mainly just uh, to lose weight. And she had uh, read a book by Doug Graham, uh, the 80, 10, 10 diet. And that, that was my first, um, uh, well, it was one of the main impact impact uh, impacts on my life to to change and, and try the diet. Uh, I've read many other books. Um, Don Bennett's written some really good books, which I highly recommend. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, there's many other uh, mentors uh, that I've had, but uh, that was the first book that I read on it. What about your the the transition? Did you kind of see it when you first? read the information did it make sense to you overnight did you go straight for it or did it take a while for you to kind of make an adjustment i had already uh, refined my diet to a level that i thought was um quite restricted by other people's standards for me it wasn't that hard to go uh, 100 percent fruitarian overnight because i had already uh, cut out eggs and, and dairy and and bread the only thing i really was eating at that time uh, that that people wouldn't say as part of a fruitarian diet would be um, like cook, cooked vegetables and, um, and, and, um, and starches like corn and, uh, and maybe rice. So I, I didn't have a difficult time transitioning. Uh, so I went overnight. Yeah. Excellent. And did you have any, uh, apart from like mentors, did, was there anyone that you were following that was, was, was there any athletes in particular that you were following that you thought, that you saw that you thought could, would, uh, would, uh, well, I guess what I'm saying is, was there any role models that you had that, that made you think it could be, it could help with your athletic performance? Now that I think back on it, there weren't any athletes that, that I think um, were following this type of diet that I, that I read about. It was really mm-hmm. what the, 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 the simple logic of, of what seemed to me very natural and a, a, a nature diet is really what drove me to go in this direction. There, there was one, one in particular athlete at the time who was promoting, uh, you know, the all fruit diet. And that was a uh, Harley Johnstone or durian rider. He, he, he definitely doesn't promote um, an only fruit diet anymore, but back then he was, and uh, he was very influential uh, for me at that time. And um, 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 when did you start seeing the progress in terms of your results with your with your running? Was it was it quite Immediate. soon? Yeah, really. Instantly, the, you know, the next day, two days, three days, uh, I saw tremendous gains um, immediately. It was it was phenomenal. 
I, I think any, anybody, anybody who's on a clean diet, if they move to all raw fruit diet, uh, as I, I experienced in, in the next morning, uh, I was running faster and feeling better. Right. And I think the important thing is here, as an athlete, you would have probably been very aware of how your body performs and like obviously the time that you ran or the distance and all that stuff. So it was as clear as that you saw the difference basically immediately just through changing the diet alone. Definitely. Uh, without question. It's like uh, if you quit smoking, <laughs> you're going to be able to breathe easier. Right. If, you eat, if, you, if you're just eating high water content fruit, your digestion, everything is, is just, you know, you just, it's just an incredible, incredible diet. And am I, am I right in thinking that um, you, at that point, you hadn't ran any ultra marathons. You'd, you'd done maybe some marathons or, or where were you at with your, with, your, uh, with your running at that point? I was mainly focused on trying to run a fast, a very fast marathon. I wanted to run under two hours and 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is in the days before of these new fancy shoes with springs in them, by the way. Uh, <laughs> if, anybody's, if anybody's a runner, these new shoes are, um, it's a different sport at this point, in my opinion. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, but I'm not going to get into that too much. But it's, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I, I was I was focused on the marathon and didn't take that that long until I did um, run much much faster, uh, and and it, I think it took me I think it took another year year and a half before I actually broke two hours and thirty minutes after I started on the diet, uh, but I I, I I went from basically running two hours and forty five minutes as my best uh, marathon PR to uh, almost have 15 minute um, improvement, which is, which is a tremendous, tremendous improvement for people who are familiar with marathon running. Yeah, that's massive. And do you think that, that that can again could happen for like even some of the elite athletes, if they were to change diet, do you think that they could get a boost like that? Uh, most people, yes. Elite athletes, ones that are uh, training at altitude, that are already at a very low body fat, they're, they're running, you know, 120 miles a week. I think what they're going to see, in, um, they're not going to see at times improve that much, but they're going to see the recovery uh, improve very uh, a lot. They won't get sick. They'll be able to, they'll be able to do a higher load, and, uh, and I think they'll, they'll feel better um, in every way, physically, emotionally. And, and of course they will improve, but if you're already running a marathon in two hours and 10 minutes, and you've got incredible natural ability, uh, the fruitarian diet is going to help you um, improve, but it's not going to improve by 15 minutes <laughs> at that level. Sure. You're going to improve, you know, you'll improve by, uh, you know, a few minutes maybe, which, which is great. That's, that's still a lot at that level. But that kind of, that improvement, am I right in thinking that led you on to like exploring what was the limit of what you could do basically and heading towards ultra marathons, which, and maybe you can explain to us what that means and, and some of your achievements in that. Yeah, I think we all have genetic uh, limitations in how fast we can run, how high we can jump, uh, you know, even how long you can hold, hold your breath. Uh, and you, know, you, you do the best you can uh, on the best diet. So I thought that my, my limit in a marathon based on my just my genetic makeup would be somewhere in the mid two two twenties, and I ran pretty close to that uh, for the marathon, and uh, and that's why I decided to go into ultra marathon running, which is a really a different sport than marathon running. Right. Uh, so, so so I w I went into running fifty miles, a hundred kilometers, um, hundred miles, uh, and then I ran I I got up to uh, the two hundred and fifty kilometer distance, uh, which was actually two hundred and fifty three kilometers is the most I've run at one time. Um, and yeah, so that, so I felt like I pushed myself to the limits in that area. And I, I now I've considered doing multi-day runs. Mm -hmm. Um, but genetically I seem to need sleep. Uh, I, just, <laughs> I, I, you know, some people only need three, four, five hours a night. I, I, I genetically just didn't do really well with eight, eight to nine hours. So I don't know if I'm going to get too far into the multi-day running. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I saw I think I saw a video of you a while back and it was kind of like you'd pushed yourself possibly beyond your limit and you'd got kind of sick at one point because of yeah. maybe overtraining or overrunning. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, a, 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 a fruitarian diet is going to do a lot of benefits for you, but there's there's the laws of gravity that exist. And, <laughs> you know, you can't you can't um, you can't eat, eat a diet that's going to make you, uh, you know, imperial. Imper 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 what's the word? Uh, 
yeah, you, you got to sleep. And if I don't do that, no matter what diet I'm on, I'm going to fall apart. And did you ever get uh, like an experience like hyponatremia or anything like that? Where you, I think that means where you go low in sodium. Did you get that experience? Yeah, God, it's been such a long time uh, since I had any of these issues. That's that's a good point. When I yeah, when I I went when I transitioned off eating processed foods, I, and I was virtually having a uh, you know no added salt diet. My body did have uh, quite a while uh, until it adjusted. And I, I remember running, doing big miles in hot weather, and I definitely ran into having uh, sodium issues. And I did take um, like uh, sodium or electrolyte tablets uh, for about the first year and when I would do very long distance running. And, and then uh, what I thought was really great is I, I, just, I just didn't need them that much anymore. And oh man, it's been more than 10 years since I've had one of those electrolyte pills. Um, and no matter how clean I eat now, I, I never run into the hyponatremia issues. My body's adjusted. Mm -hmm. it, it absorbs the, the electrolytes or the sodium from the fruits and vegetables that I eat. And do you, uh, I mean, I, I, I remember some early videos of you with like massive, not just the fruits, but also like really big salads as well. Um, do you, uh, I mean, you, you obviously talk about the fruitarian diet. Do you see that as an all fruit diet? Do you try and follow an all fruit diet? Have you done that at times? And do you mix it up at other times or how do you look at all that? I definitely eat primarily fruit for calories. Uh, the first couple of years I ate massive salads at, in the evening. Mm. And I, I, without a doubt, stopped uh, doing that. I, I do have salads, uh, but very infrequently. I'd say the longer I'm on a fruit diet, the I'm drawn less and less to greens, mm. like uh, especially difficult greens like uh, kale. I mean, I used to eat, I used to have kale salads with avocado dressing and I would just eat tons and tons of kale. And now I, I almost never eat kale. I don't want kale. Sure. I, I eat a romaine lettuce or, um, or even iceberg, which I don't even think you can call that a green iceberg is just basically crunchy water. <laughs> yeah. And I think that, um, obviously I, well, I know that you're, uh, from New York, Entre you're an entrepreneur, probably quite a stressful lifestyle in that kind of environment. Um, did you find any challenges with fitting it into with your with your work and you know with meeting people, being around people? Was it was it any uh, challenge for you in that? Well, I, I would classify myself as an introvert. I'm I'm not I'm not one to want to go to big parties or restaurants with big groups of people. I'm focused mainly on on my own hobbies, and I I like to try to create uh, services or products uh, as an entrepreneur for, for people. So I, I'm a business owner. I've always been self-employed. Uh, so I'm, I'm really always uh, got my mental focus on, you know, how do I make better services or products? Um, so this, so socially, I didn't have a problem eating this way very much. Uh, I, 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 I still don't uh, find myself looking to go to restaurants or, mm. or, or big social events. So I'm, I'm okay with it. I think for somebody who's very social, the diet would be significantly more challenging, but my health is the most important asset that I have that I'll ever have. And I really focus on that all the time. I, I don't want to go to a party and feel social pressure to eat foods that are going to make me feel terrible. So I, I don't drink alcohol uh, ever. I don't do any recreational drugs. You know, I like to get good amount of sleep. And spending time with the quality people. Oops. Excellent, excellent. And I got a call. I got a call coming in, Ronnie. Can we pause it? Okay, we'll pause it. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Well, well, that's. I mean, that's great to know. I mean, a lot of people obviously would think about the 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 business world as all these meetings and people going to like restaurants all the time and all this kind of stuff. But obviously, it's not. That's not been a problem for for you. Um, anyway, I think that would I be right in thinking that. Uh, you had this idea for the Woodstock Fruit Festival. At what point did that come into your mind? When did you, I'm, I'm guessing at first of what you didn't even have a name for it or, or did it start with the name or the dream or where did this all come from? Well, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm an introvert, but I'm not super antisocial. I, I definitely enjoy spending time with people who have the same interests and ideas and, uh, and ideals in life. And I'd at, at back in 2000, uh, 
you know, eight, when I started eating this way in 2009, I, I, I got friendly with people on YouTube. And at the time, Facebook wasn't popular. Ugh, I don't even know if it existed in 2008, but it, uh, there were other forums and, and chat groups. And I, I met up with some of these people and had a wonderful time. And, we, you know, people that would get really excited about really high quality fruit. I, I don't know what it is, <laughs> but like, if, 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 you know, if you show me a really good uh, you know, honeydew that's like, you know, where you, you pick it up and you smell it and it's like, it's like, you know, the greatest perfume and, you know, you just like, you, you just get really excited. I, I, it, yeah, it's strange. Most people just don't understand it. But when I hung out with other people that got really excited about really high quality fruit, it was awesome. I, I was super excited about that. So uh, I thought, you know, why don't we put together a, um, a party? And it wasn't, the, what, the idea wasn't to have an annual event. It was kind of just like an idea, hey, let's all go meet up at a campground. And that's mm -hmm. really what, what I looked into doing. I, I went to a campground uh, about two hours north of where I live I, I, in New York City. I, I love the mountains. I love nature. And uh, it's a really beautiful area in the Catskill Mountains and, um, in the summertime. And I, I found the campground and, and I put down $5,000 to rent the entire campground. And I figured, spread the word and my, my impetus wasn't to make money at, at all. It was just to bring people together. I, I was just kind of a donation that I thought would, would maybe get paid back if people pitched in. And anyway, anyway, fast forward, uh, about three, four months later, the interest was, was actually growing quite fast. And, uh, we had a really big rainstorm and, uh, the campground got kind of washed out. They, uh, they was right by a river and most of the facilities were destroyed. And we were in this bad situation where, we needed to find another facility and we also decided that if it had rained that week we would be in a lot of trouble the fruit festival would be this horrible experience so <laughs> i dug into my pocket a lot more uh, like much much more than five thousand dollars and and i took a huge chance and we rented um a, a much nicer facility in the catskill mountains and then it became a serious project and that's um that's when Yulia, who's the, the still the administrator, uh, the director of the event, she, she was working full time on it. And uh, it, it grew really fast. It was really the first of its kind. And because I was willing to put in a significant amount of money to get it started and organized and make it really a professional operation, it grew. And now we're going to have the 10th year. And it's, uh, it's definitely one of the greatest things that I've ever been involved in, in my life, although it hasn't been all fun. It's, it's a lot of stress putting on such a big event uh, as well as you can try to do it. There's always people that don't have good experiences for one reason or another and dealing with those challenging situations. Uh, it, it's definitely a job, uh, but a lot of people enjoy it. And I try to focus on that and they come back year after year. So we keep doing it. I heard a rumor that the first year that you didn't actually get to be at the whole event or something because you had a race. Is that, is that right? Yeah, the, the first year I, I was really heavily into ultra running at that point in, in my life. And I was really at the top of my game. And I, uh, before I started the fruit festival, the idea to have a fruit festival, I had signed up for some very prestigious uh, ultra marathon races. And I, they were so important to me that I, I, I wasn't even at the, uh, the, the, the beginning of the first fruit festival. I, and, um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit regretful. I felt like maybe people might think that's kind of arrogant or something, but <laughs> uh, I got to follow my heart. Um, I love fruit and I love running and uh, running took, took the, the priority that on that day, which was in hindsight, pretty crazy. I don't think I could do that again, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it was great to show up and everybody was having a good time. <laughs> yeah. So, so, I guess you didn't know whether it would work out, whether people would enjoy it in the in the first year. What was what are your memories of that time, and and um, what kind of stands out for you in that experience? Um, we've had what I would consider more successful fruit festivals since the first one in terms of attendance, uh, and uh, you know, and, and more fruit diversity, just more activities, more stuff. But the the what I, what I think back to the first event, it was, it was like, um, it was an old school kind of, uh, legendary event in my mind for me. Anyway, it was me living, uh, an experience that 
it would probably be one of the, the greatest memories of, of my, my life. It was, it was seeing for the first time in, in, in person, uh, a lot of people that I, that I admired tremendously from afar mm-hmm. to meet them in person, our collective energy, uh, is what created what the fruit festival uh, turned into, which was a much bigger event. It was, it was a people with a head, a lot of purity. There, there was, there was virtually um, no special interests or people looking to, you know, they were looking, everybody was, was there to just to share in the joy of, of fruit and, and the simplicity of, of health. And it was just, pu- just beautiful, very relaxing. People's expectations were very low and, it was the first, really the first big event. And it was, it was beautiful. It was just really beautiful. It was a, it was a, it was a miracle of, uh, of inspiration. And yeah, I look back on it uh, with, with great fondness. Yeah. There's, there's some amazing video footage from that first event. And that's what I saw that led me to go the next year. And for me, when I, when I still look at that, those videos, there is something really special about that. And it feels like, a real kind of paradise was created for that for that time, which I think still is is what the festival lives up to, really. Yeah, yeah, I think I think one of the reasons why I, I keep putting on the event is I'm trying to recapture that that those special moments, and 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 we I do capture them uh, in large part at every event, but it was also smaller. That we only, we only had about 170 or 180 people at the first event, so you really got to spend time with people in, on an individual level. Uh, whereas now the event is is significantly larger, and and the and the facility that we rent is much bigger, so so it's it's great. It's just it's a much bigger it's a bigger party. It's it's a, it's a it's a real event where the first fruit festival was 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 more of almost like a family reunion, even although it was the first time we ever got right. together. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, so over the years, the festival's grown. It's got bigger. Um, Obviously, it moved, but it's only been a, since then. It's only been a, a Camp Walden, although you did have the event in Hawaii as well. Um, there's been all sorts of different, sometimes controversies connected to the event. People have left, people have come, people have went and come back, and all these things. How, how have you felt over the years about that? With all the challenges you've had in putting it on, and your generosity in putting the time in to do it. How, how did it feel when all these kind of different challenges came up and, and controversies and things like that? Yeah, there's definitely been a lot of drama. You know, hu- humans, for whatever reasons, uh, in our natural design, don't seem to get along very well. <laughs> I guess it's part of the, our, our, our natural design to push each other to improve. So if somebody's critical of you, you might not like it, but in some way they're, they're really your, they're your best teachers. They're, they're, they're best motivators to make improvements in your life and to change. So although it wasn't pleasant going through some of these uh, dr- dramatic uh, you know, arguments that people would have about uh, you know, A to Z, um, it helped us to, to improve. It, 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 it pushed me not to, um, to let myself get too emotional about these things and step back, take a look at the bigger picture, uh, look at the trend line, you know, that we've, we've, we've affected people on a positive level uh, for many years. And we'd have, we've been able to achieve a lot together, although we haven't all stuck together. Um, the snowball keeps rolling. And uh, I don't have any regrets. Uh, I, I try not to hold grudges. Although some people, I don't necessarily trust them to uh, to be supportive in the future, so they might not have been invited back to the event. Hmm. Uh, but overall, I think we're doing a good job, and uh, and I hope I hope it continues. Yeah, and uh, and I've been to the festival a lot of times, so I, I highly recommend it to everyone that I've uh, encountered, and hope to I'll, I'll be coming back this year again. Um, you also at, at one point you made a decision to move to Hawaii, although I don't think you live there anymore, but um, what kind of inspired that? My, my dream to move to a tropical environment was, I was really concerned about the amount of uh, conventionally grown fruits and vegetables that I was eating. In the winter time, especially, it's very hard to get local or organic uh, fruits 
in New York. Although from, from New York, it, it is definitely one of the greatest places to be a fruitarian. There's, this so, there's so much variety uh, that's brought in from all over the world. Sure. Yeah, I can't. Uh, I wanted to get to a climate where the temperature was was physically uh, warmer. Um, I, I have a computer job, so I, I work from home, and I really enjoy uh, just wearing a t-shirt and shorts when I'm working. Uh, so, so moving to Hawaii was was kind of a dream, and and I was able to do that. Uh, and I lived there for six years. Uh, I, I was, I still, I still uh, own a house there, and I still plan on spending a lot of time in Hawaii in the future. Uh, but I, I love New York, and I found a balance between um, both both environments. Uh, you know, in our modern times, you can be a fruitarian um, in most most industrialized uh, countries and most in most urban cities if you just make the effort. I think Hawaii is a, or any tropical climate is a great place for people to visit and spend a significant amount of time um, for their health and also their perspective uh, on on life. I, I love Hawaii. I don't need to be there all the time. I'm not miserable at all in New York. I love New York. Uh, yeah, it's a variety to live in different climates. Um, and I encourage people to get to the tropics to experience the, the joys of our, our, our natural climate as a species. Were you able to get more, are, are, are you actually able to get more variety in New York than in Hawaii in terms of fruit? Uh, I would, I would say I can get, well, on the island of Oahu, where I was living, they have whole foods and pretty much all the fruits that you would find in a, in a, in a New York supermarket could actually be found in on Oahu as well. Uh, the prices are a lot higher because everything has to be flown in. But when I, when I'm in Hawaii, I eat a lot less variety and I'm okay with that. Sure. Uh, uh, I own property where we, we grow papaya and I, I actually eat, um, quite a bit of young coconuts when I'm in Hawaii. Um, and I eat a lot of like mangoes. Wow. Oh, during mango season, like I mono mangoes constantly. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm okay with simplicity. I'm, I'm really okay with it. But if you want variety, big cities have, have so much to offer. It's, it's so no yeah. problem being a fruitarian in New York. And, and what were the other benefits of why I'm guessing the weather, did you feel a big, a big difference from being out in the tropical climate all the time? Well, when I, when I lived in Hawaii, one thing I loved so much was, was of course, the weather, but being able to sleep, um, sleep with, the, with outside or not, not fully outside, like not camping, but uh, I have a house where you can, uh, it's, it's, it's covered in case it rains, but you can, you can it's like a big, sc uh, like a screened in porch and to sleep outside at night to hear the nature of the, the wind in the palm trees and, you know, the, the bugs at night, mm. uh, the birds in the morning, to wake up to that. Uh, to see the moon and the star, the silver sky. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's like out of some, um, you know, movie that, uh, that it's a fantasy world. So I, I really, I really enjoy the, the nighttime, the sleeping environment in the tropics. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, I think you were kind of pulled away from that. So there was, this, this was obviously uh, uh, in the news and everything was, you were kind of the, the victim of, fraud in your business and this all ended in um a situation i think where you ended up uh in jail for a while um well yeah so that, that that's yeah i mean I'll, I'll mention that a little bit my my lawyers recommended that i don't talk about it too much not until at least uh sure. i'm done dealing with the the the, the 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 federal authorities but i yeah i i, I wouldn't say i went to a prison i went to uh, what's called a camp yeah. So there's, there's, there's no bars or fences. Um, it's kind of like a, like going to a, like a summer, yeah, like a summer camp uh, where, where, you know, you can go outside whenever you want. Um, but yeah, I did get wrapped up in uh, some legal problems uh, back in 2017. I was a victim of extortion and uh, the FBI was trying to help me get out of that problem. Uh, the person that was extorting me was in another country in India and uh, the Indian authorities wouldn't, uh, would not work with the FBI in trying to apprehend this person. Uh, so ba basically somebody was extorting me by writing uh, fake uh, reviews about my business on the internet. And uh, the, 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 just the very broad summary of that was, uh, I went to court, I spent um, 
more than a year getting a court order to get these fake reviews removed from the internet. We had to prove that this person was extorting our business and that these reviews were all fake. And, um, and we got the court order. Um, but here's where we ran into a big problem. The, the internet is, does not have the same, uh, laws as print media, like newspapers. If somebody takes out an advertisement in a newspaper and a print uh, publication and if tries to defame you, uh, and write fictitious things about you, you can sue the newspaper and the person that, uh, asked them to publish these things. Sure. Um, but on the internet, there's something called the uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which was passed in 1996 when the internet was trying to um, get off the ground. And it basically absolved internet, um, internet providers from any liability if somebody would write uh, anything uh, fictitious, you know, defame mm-hmm. somebody. So although I could, I could sue somebody for defamation, who was writing uh, fake things about me or my business on the internet, uh, internet providers have no legal liability. So in this case, Google was published, was, wasn't publishing uh, these fake reviews, but they were reporting on somebody who was. And the long story short, I, I got the court ordered that these fake reviews be removed, um, but Google would not cooperate with taking these things down off the internet because they had no legal liability to do so. Um, but for, for, for whatever reasons, Google sometimes will, will honor a court order um, because they, I think they, they, they don't want to uh, bring on this perception that, um, that the internet can be used just as a tool for extortion. Mm. And they, some, they, in some cases, they will comply to court orders, not comply, they will, they will honor a court order and they will remove uh, content. And you see this in like revenge porn. They're very proactive in taking down revenge porn. Um, but I, I, so I had some success in getting these fake reviews removed from the internet with the, with the legitimate court order that I had. Uh, but Google, uh, although they did initially help take down these fake reviews, more and more reviews from this uh, person who was extorting us continued to show in the results. And then um, in, in, in a moment of, less than better judgment, I decided to take my original court order um, at the advice of a third party, which was really frustrating. I was working with a a company or a legal department um, that recommended that I add the new uh, fake reviews that were that were now showing in results and and put them on the original court order that I had. Uh, I did that and sent it to Google. And um, sometimes Google would take remove those links and sometimes they wouldn't. Uh, fast forward uh, about two years after I had initially done this and, um, and, and these reviews were, weren't showing my business was doing well. Um, everything seemed to be fine, but Google apparently decided they wanted to check the validity of all the court orders that were submitted to them. And they saw that I had altered, um, some of these court orders. So they, they, uh, they, they prosecuted me and, uh, shockingly, although I had, done actions to protect my business. Uh, nothing I had done uh, was in the motive of trying to make money or to hurt any individual person. I was only trying to uh, basically have Google remove these fake reviews, which the court had already uh, declared as, as something that needed to be uh, taken down. Uh, I was prosecuted and I was used that as an example. And uh, they sentenced me to uh, to eight months um, imprisonment. Although I, I didn't go to a prison, I went to a camp and shockingly, I really uh, had a very, um, very enjoyable experience there. I, I don't want to get into it too much, but I, I, I ended up going, having this experience in, at, a, at a very good time in my life. Um, in my early 40s, most of my three children, and they were uh, mostly all grown up, um, two of them living on their own. And um, I'd been working extensively for over you know, 20 years. So this was a great experience for me to sleep a lot, read a lot, exercise a lot. Um, and, and I always, I would only had to go through this experience for a relatively short period of time. So it was, and of course, going to a camp versus a real prison was a, uh, was a big lucky break. Uh, so, and, and most of the people at this, at this uh, facility were, um, 
were had similar circumstances to me. They were professionals, uh, business owners, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, CPAs, uh, all from New York. And um, not all of them were, were, were respectable people. There were definitely some criminals there, in my opinion. But a lot of them uh, had a similar situation where they maybe made a, a, a mistake that wasn't in the best um, in the best <laughs> their best interests and the government really decided to smack them real hard. Mm. So it was, so I, I spent a lot of time with people that had a very similar background uh, to me. And um, it was, it was very, I think the word is cathartic. Yeah. We, we really, we, it was a healing experience for all of us. And uh, I came out of that experience feeling really good. I got in super shape. Um, <laughs> I, Cause I, I, I mean, I exercised, you know, twice a day, uh, and shockingly, um, I was able to eat all raw for five of the eight months. And I mean, all raw, uh, <laughs> they, had, they had unlimited, um, stone fruits. And, um, a lot of the guys at this place wanted to eat a protein based diet because that's the rage, of course, uh, sure. these low carb diet. So there was a tremendous amount of fruit, not a lot of diversity. So I, so I, I think I found some of my best health. Um, through this experience. So, so the point is that, you, you know, you've run into challenges in your life, whether, you know, you're, uh, it's with work or in a relationship and you, you got to really try to look at the bright side. There's always something good that you can, you can make out of it. And although it's hard to see the goodness in some of these experiences, uh, they're there if you, if you try to focus on them. Yeah, that's amazing. And it is really amazing that you were able to stay, stay raw in that situation as well. Um, pretty incredible. So what's next for you? I mean, are you going to, are you thinking of going back to running? Are you, is that you finished with running or what, what are you going to do next? You think? Well, I hope I'm never finished with running. Not until they put me in the ground. I, I, I'm a human being and, and we have these long legs and we have arms and I feel like it's, it's, it's just our natural. Uh, it's just, it's, it's natural to run. So I, I love, I love to run. Uh, and I, I, I don't think I'm going to be competing at a level that's going to surpass my, my, my best uh, performances from when I was in my uh, early thirties. Um, but I, I'm going to still compete. I've run the Boston marathon, I think 24 times and I'm going to keep doing it every year. I run the New York city marathon often. So yeah, health is a uh, running is, 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 is a display of your health and vitality and it keeps me motivated to never forget that our greatest joys um, are the ability to be free and with our in free in health. So the irony is when I was at this, this camp, you know, being punished, I had more freedoms than I'd ever, ever experienced as an adult because I, I had no responsibilities. I had no responsibility. I just, every day I could do, you know, what I wanted, how I wanted, uh, for the most part. Yeah, sure. I could, I couldn't leave, uh, the facility, but, um, Psychologically I, and, and, and emotionally, I felt um, very well rested and, and, uh, and my health became a, a renewed focus. So again, I think health is our greatest freedom and uh, I'm always going to run if I can because I love, I love to feel good. Uh, but in terms of like competing, are you going to try and do any races, anything like that or, or uh, just for your own pleasure sort of thing? But when I, 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 when I turned 40, I'm 43 now. When I turned 40, I decided I wanted to try to see what I could do as a master's runner. Um, I ran the Boston Marathon. Um, well, no, I'm sorry, the New York City Marathon in 237 when I was 40. And then when I got out of this camp, um, I was a few months before I turned 43. I ran even faster. Uh, I ran 235 at the recent New York City Marathon. So... I've actually, you know, improved my running performances um, as I've gotten older. I, I'm, I'm not so focused on trying to run my, you know, super fast. I, I think, mm -hmm. you know, at my age, I'm still usually placing in the top three in my age group, which is good. But I, I just run for joy and, and for, yeah, just for joy at this point. I'm not, so, I'm not competing with anybody. I just want to feel good. So I'm going to always run. I'm going to run races and, uh, yeah. And the, the fruit festival, do you feel that will continue or do you think there's a point where you'll bring that to an end at some point? Uh, well, I won't bring it to an end. Uh, I don't think I can do that. 
I, I think if I, if I just want to step away at some point because I want less responsibility in my life, which is, which is a result of, of, of my experience of having no responsibility for eight months, <laughs> it was so nice having no responsibility. Um, I really, I got spoiled. So if I decide that I want to step back from the fruit festival, I think somebody else will pick it up and keep it going. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm open to that. I don't, I don't run the fruit festival as, as a, as a business to uh, make money. And um, I hope it continues uh, for as, as, as long as I'm alive. I think it has the ability to stay, to, 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 to stay a, an annual event. Mm -hmm. It's um, if anybody's interested in taking over the fruit festival, I might be interested in handing it over. <laughs> and uh, maybe I'm, Maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think Rainey, Rainey, who often films at the festival, I think uh, he's been making a documentary. Maybe that's partly filmed at the festival, or, or I'm not sure if that kind of came to came to fruition at the festival. Do you know anything about that, or what's happening with that, or are you involved at all? Uh, I'm involved a little bit. I've been interviewed for that film. Rainey's. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, creating a, 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 a real motion picture about um, a fruit-based diet. And I know he's, he's being supported by somebody who's very generous uh, in, in the interest of making this, this film. And uh, I, I, I don't know exactly when it's going to be completed, um, but I, th I think it'll bring a spotlight to a fruit-based diet as um, kind of the next level in people looking for the ultimate uh, experience in, in our best health. So I'm, I'm excited about it. I haven't seen a lot of the, uh, the footage. I just know that it's, it's a very substantial investment, um, that somebody very generous has, has, uh, contributed towards. And, and I'm not that person. I'm not that person, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, I think you've always, I, I feel like you've always said a number of times at some point, you're going to write a book about all this. Um, have you got any plans of doing that? Any ideas? Ooh, I spent a lot of time writing when I was uh, at this camp and uh, I do have a lot of material. And I, I think part of the reason why I haven't published a book yet is I, I feel like the book's still being written. Uh, years ago, I thought I had enough material to write a book. And, and of course I did if I just wanted to focus it on one specific area, but I, I want to write a book eventually, not just about the fruit-based diet or being an entrepreneur, running a business or being a uh, father um, or, 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 you know, sticking through, uh, you know, difficult, um, ups and downs of relationships. Um, I want, I want to, you know, write a book about all of these things as, as a, just a, a kind of a, a memoir about my life. And I'm still really young and I've got a lot of dreams and plans ahead and I've written it various times over the last, uh, 10 years and all the material is still being formulated into what I hope will be, uh, something that I'll take a lot of personal satisfaction in sharing with the world at some future date when it feels right. Fantastic. So, um, obviously if, if people want to find more, uh, more about the festival, um, is that, that's the website, the Woodstock fruit festival.com. Is that right? Yes. The Woodstock fruit festival.com. And if the, if anyone wants to get in touch with you or find out more about you, do you have a, a personal website or anything like that? They can, uh, find out more or uh, I created a website when I first got into running called the fruitarian.com I haven't updated that website in, in a long long time I, I did create a new website uh, which is just my name Michael Arnstein.com and I, I created uh, some new content there I've written about some of my experiences um, when I was away at this camp and uh, I'm gonna probably update that website more regularly in the future so they can check that out. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for joining us today on the podcast. And uh, if uh, just to say to the audience, if you've liked this, please leave us a comment, a reply, um, share it with other people you might think uh, would find it interesting. And if you're interested in learning more about this kind of lifestyle, then you can certainly go to the woodstockfruitfestival.com. And I believe the event is the mid middle of August 2020 is the next one. Yes. And, and we'll see you there at that event. Highly recommended. And we look forward to seeing you there. So thank you very much, Michael. Any last words before we finish? I just want to say uh, uh, thanks to all the people out there, including yourself, Ronnie, for creating content, 
I, I think it's overwhelming to look at social media and see how difficult it is to, to reach a big audience now because the space is so saturated. I guess that's why I've stepped away from social media. It's just, it's just too difficult. It feels too difficult to me to get any real traction. Um, but I think that's, that's not the best uh, approach. I, I think all of us sharing our experiences, uh, contributing to try and improve our collective health is a great thing. So the people that are, that are on social media that are kind of carrying the torches and many candles um, to be the lighthouse for better health, I appreciate what you're all doing. Uh, I'm doing my best by putting on the fruit festival. Uh, I'm not on social media almost at all because I, I'm, I'm kind of focused on other projects now. Um, so I just want to say thanks to everybody for, for making that effort to share uh, and spread the word. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Michael. And thanks everyone for listening. And we'll see you again in the next episode of the Love Fruit podcast. Bye-bye.